I'm proud to be a farmer. I'm even greater. It gives me even greater pride. Louder? All right. Sorry about that. I'm proud to be a farmer myself. It gives me even greater pride to be here today representing cotton farmers who are participating in the cotton programs of the National Farmers Organization in collective bargaining. We have had many successes and some failures. All of them have contributed towards a workable cotton program with a pay system, procedures that can be expanded to the scope to handle any amount of cotton that we need to handle in the United States to set a price on a commodity. A few years ago, a fellow by the name of Columbus left Spain and came over to the Bahamas and found cotton. He went, returned to Spain and knew he had been to India, announced that he had made the trip to India, because that was the only place that this mysterious, miraculous, miracle fiber existed in the world today at that time, that they knew of it at that time. Later on, it was found that cotton was growing in Central and South America, wild. Early farmers in the United States, such as Washington and Jefferson, grew cotton. In the late 1700s in the United States, we had a boom in cotton, and that was caused because over in England, which at that time was the textile capital of the world, they had made an announcement that they had invented a fantastic machine, a spinning jenny, and then later on the loom, and they could handle all the cotton in the world, and they made an announcement to the world that every pound of cotton that would be produced in the world, they would buy. So you know the American farmer, he went to work. And so in the late 1700s, cotton became a commercial commodity grown in the United States for export. At that time, those little old people had to, you know, after they picked it off the, not, what? I'm sorry. <clears throat> people had to, to pick the cotton by hand and then, in turn, take it into the barn or the shed or wherever and pick the seed apart from the lint. Well, the like, American farmer saw that he had a market for this cotton now, and they had to do something about it, and we had a guy named Eli Whitney that invented a cotton gin to take that seed out. And then from that point forward, cotton became faster, and the production came up and up and up and up and uh, to be produced for export. Farmers realized that they could increase from $4 an acre return to $40 an acre return on cotton. And they went, carried the seed into the Mississippi Delta, found every piece of fertile ground they could, they could find, planted it, grew it, ginned it, exported it, and supplied the world. And since that, from that time till now, have been one of the most important and largest exporters of cotton in, in the United States, uh, I mean in the world, the United States farmer has been. I want to tie this together with the fact that that movement was perhaps one of the most important movements in the economy, in the economics of the growth of this nation in the early stages, and has been ever since. When a farmer doesn't make any money, then the United States doesn't make any money. That's on all commodities, and cotton has played a very important part in that. But now we have a problem. And that problem is a very simple problem. We as farmers are not pricing our commodity according to our cost of production. You've heard that time and time again. But the simple problem has just as simple a solution, and that is to do it. Figure your cost of production, put your price on it, and sell it for that price. The NFO Cotton Division started in 1969 and 70 with a dream that we could forward contract cotton on contracts with contracts that would reflect our cost of production plus a reasonable profit. That dream came faster than we thought it would. We have since 1971 been contracting cotton 
prior to planting and prior to harvesting on contract with buyers, mills, that have been willing to forward contact with us, and we've been expanding ever since. For an example of where we've come, since 1973, the NFO cotton farmer has had the ability and the opportunity to forward contract cotton in every year, 73 through up and through 1979, we've already forward contracted cotton for 70 cents a pound. This is our cost of production in this particular area of about 60 cents a pound, so it's a profit. Not good enough because parity is 92 cents, but a good profit. So through the program, the NFO farmer has had the ability and the opportunity to sell his cotton at cost plus a profit on a forward contract. Some of those contracts were made as much as 18 months prior to harvest and nine months prior to planting. And this was, was our goal in the, originally, and we have achieved this goal to this extent. But now we need to get the volume together up to 30% so that we can not only set the price for ourselves, but be instrumental in setting the price for all cotton farmers. And in turn, of course, grain and all goes right along with it. We're all tied together. And the reason why I want to tie grain in here real quick is, is when a cotton farmer can make money, he doesn't grow grain. When he can't make money, he goes back to the soybeans and the grain, and we become a glut on the market. So we've got to get the grain prices up, the cotton prices up, and keep them up. We've negotiated for and sold cotton from every major cotton producing area in the United States through NFO. I know of not one farmer who has been disappointed in the NFO cotton program. And I've been working with it quite a long while. The only thing that we haven't done is gotten out and got those other five. Mr. Berglund told us we needed to do this. We know we need to do it. Why don't we get it done? We will get it done. All we have to do now is leave this convention, go home, and get the job done. We have the tools. We have the mechanism. And all we need is your help to get the cotton signed up, the commodity signed up that you're involved with, and go home and get the job done. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. The next report we have will be the sheep report from Dick Hammond, who is the director of the sheep division. Dick uh, lives in Salt Lake City and covers the heavy producing area of the sheep production in this country. Dick? First of all, I wanted to thank Orrin Lee for telling me where to go and rent a suit and a tie. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> I noticed this, and I think it's indicative of what's going on. We're staying at the Sheraton, probably most of you are. And the little sign says, how well did we serve you? And that's going to be my thought for the day. As Phil Allen would say, something to think about. I came with NFO for one reason. I came to make a difference. We made one. I want to publicly say that I went to the slaughter cattle division yesterday, sat in on their, on their meeting, it was packed full, and we had a little gal get up and tell it like it was. And I want to say to Mrs. Cox, she did one whale of a job. And those, <laughs> now I came with NFO, I had quite, a, I've had quite a, a bit of a conversation here. And I've had some people say, you know, we're just a little bit worried about you professionals. It's a good thought. 
And I said, okay, I want to get the golden thread. I want to find out how us professionals come across. Okay, how are professionals come? That's one thing I've never been accused of is not talking loud enough. <laughs> but anyway, I, I really did. I went out and I wanted to look for, because we are two kinds of horses. You're one, you're one horse and I'm another horse. And unless we pull in team with the, dri with the right driver, we're just, you know, not going to get too far. But when I came into NFO, I had a formula that I was going to, to work with. And it's called the three P's. And the first P was production. Because I can't really figure I'm going to get a crop or I can do anything or talk, talk to anybody without a crop. The second one was performance. And the third one was pricing. Now my objectives were to price, which we've been able to do in the sheep division. We're not the biggest thing in, in NFO by, by any factor. But we might be that drill bit that's dig digging through that hard rock and showing the way for the rest of you. The second was I wanted to sort. I wanted our people to be able to sort in their corrals, call their weighing conditions, be able to do it and do it right. And they do. I'm very happy to announce that I'm probably the most worthless thing that they've got in the sheep division because nobody needs me anymore. We got it put together, we do it, and we do it right. The last thing I wanted to do was to be able to audit our own books and we send them a bill. They don't tell us how much they're going to pay us. We tell them how much we're going to pay, how much they're going to pay, and we do it. But I want to tell you one thing, and I notice it. I don't know whether it's, uh, and I'm a grandpa, so I can say this to most of you, that I don't know whether it's age or what, but we're either going to get with it and get just a little bit mean, not only with the, with the, with the buyers, but we got to get mean with ourselves. Now that guy across the road that continually allows his cows to come in and graze on your grain field is going to have some way, shape, or form, we're going to have to put up a fence line, and we're going to have to do it mutually, because he's got to stay in business, and so do you. But I'm going to say one thing. This thing is not just an NFO. It's a mutual farm problem. And we're going to have to put it together or somebody will put it together for you. Now, I'm from the industry. And the industry spells defeat G-R-E-E-D. And they've capitalized on it for years. You've heard it for years. But well, we're going to have to get in a position. Now, the sheep division is going to be in a position, and I'm still in the position to stand before you and say, I am the largest representative of a single sheep block in the United States. And I'm proud to do that. <laughs> but you remember one thing. It's not Dick Hammond. It's you folks out there that have made it possible. And as long as, you, as, long as we stay fractionalized, uh, I said the other day, I said NFO is just like one giant picture puzzle. And I don't know how many of you sat on a winter's night and put a picture puzzle together. 
But by gosh, if there's two or three pieces missing, it sure ruins the whole scene. All I am <clears throat> is a coach. And have you ever seen a coach run out on the field and try to play ele against 11 other players? I don't care how good a coach he is. That game's going to be over pretty quick. But if you've got a coach that puts a team together, then all of a sudden, we've got winners. That's my job, putting a team together. I'm just the coach. The team players, Richard Cook, Tom Blake, Joyce Riles, Gerald Cox, a whole bunch of guys that make this thing work. And then we go on down. But where the really team play starts is with you people who have the inventory that will give us a game plan. I got an education the other night. My age, why uh, education comes a little slower. But in this, in this state, I went over there and I bought a, a cheeseburger and a glass of orange juice. It was $3.91, and that old boy didn't back up an inch. I tried to bargain with him a little bit, and he said, either you pay it or you don't get out of here. It's that simple. Something, <clears throat> I'm very fortunate. I have a, uh, um, I'm not gonna bring religion into it, but I have a parish priest it is a past president of Loyola University. And the other day he was explaining the gospel and he says, oh, excuse me. I sound like a teacher. So after mass was over, I just went into him. And I said, I'll tell you something, Father, don't ever apologize for being a teacher. And that's exactly the kind of job I've got. I'm a teacher. I'm a fellow that when you need some help or you need some guidance, I want you to call me and I want you to get a hold of me. And if I don't do the job, then I'm a darn poor teacher. Now, I've been at this thing 30 years. That doesn't give me any credentials other than I'm getting to be close to 50. But I want to share what I have and the knowledge that I've picked up to help you folks change the system and get it in the direction that we want it to go. And that's the job of the folks that, that Orrin Lee has brought into NFO, is not to dictate, not to tell you anything, but to share their knowledge with you so that you, some way, shape, or form, can make a judgment that will be good for you. We're just a little bit, I've, I've listened to this checkoff thing again this year, and everybody is, you know, stumbling and bumbling over the checkoff deal. Well, checkoff to me is just like fertilizer. Now, I didn't say what kind but I'm gonna to stick to the sheep manure. But I'm still gonna say that Chekhov is, is fertilizer that you put on your land that brings another crop another year. Now you may not like to buy that spreader and you may not like to spend the money for it, but it's darn important for you folks to have it. And that's the way I look at it. And I'm going to close with this, and I'll, it'll be something when we talk about the government. I've got two statements to make. When we talk about the government, the other day, uh, I'm sitting in the airport in San Francisco waiting for a plane, which is normal, and I picked up a, a San Francisco Chronicle, I believe, and it told about the Port Authority firing the port director, because there was some myth 
between them and the director over a new $40 million port facility to export coal. And yet on the every day you hear how this country is in such terrific trouble over energy. So it's got to be when you start depending on anybody else but ourselves, you can find out that certainly there's a difference between what's going on and what's not. The other night, and my wife is a, is a city girl. I don't know if she's ever been on a dirt road. At least when I was dating her, I never could get her on a dirt road. But I'm going to say one thing. We had an NFO meeting in the house, and we, you know, we had the normal amount of guys, and we had a, the normal coffee and cookie bit. And I'm going to leave you with this thought, because it's totally outside of agriculture. She just turned around and looked at me and said, if you guys are so, and pardon my language, ladies, so damn smart, how come we're so far in debt? Thank you. Next. We'll have the report from the Feeder Cattle Division, Dave Miller, Director. Thank you, Owen Lee. Walt Hackney and I were just sitting there discussing that we thought maybe that this uh, microphone might have been made especially for Dick Hammond, <clears throat> the position that it was in. First of all today, I'd like to congratulate those of you members across the United States who have made our feeder program this year the success that it's been. And in the same, at the same time, I'd like to chastise those of you who have sat back and uh, growled about what you didn't like about it and didn't get in and put your shoulders to the wheel and make it work and work along with the people who were making the program progress. I'd like to talk just a little bit about the expansion of the program, the areas that we have gone into over the past year. Uh, we have moved our program into some areas uh, as far as Texas, Louisiana, South Arkansas, uh, Southern Oklahoma, where we previously haven't had a program. And as you all know, that is an absolute necessity from a collective bargaining standpoint. We had a lot of success in a lot of those areas, and I think that you who have participated in that program have certainly had an effect on the increase in prices that we've looked at uh, over the past year. We've gone into an extensive forward contracting program in the last 12 months, and as Bob Hutcherson mentioned a while ago, uh, We've had a lot of successes, and we've had some wrecks, and they all contribute toward making a better program for you and I as cattlemen in this country to give us the background and the strength that we need to establish prices at cost of production plus a profit. I'm involved in the National Farmers Organization because I believe that you and I as producers of farm commodities can and will reach our goals of cost of production plus a profit. And throughout the meetings of this convention, I believe that we have had more positive work done than any convention that I've been to, which has been the last four. I think that uh, uh, everyone here has had one thing in mind and that has been to further the cause of the National Farmers Organization to work out the problems that we have. And we've had a lot of good constructive uh, ideas brought forward and I want to thank you for that. 
Also during the past year, we have uh, improved our structure as far as uh, working out some of the kinks that we have had as far as payments are concerned, uh, as far as the uh, working relationship between the uh, feeder division and the trust. I think that we've made great strides as far as that part of the uh, program is concerned. Again, I'd like to talk a little bit about forward contracting. We have uh, started early last year. We're going to start it. In fact, we've already started this year. And when we can sell cattle, sell feeder cattle for some month out in the future, and nail down a price, it makes it awfully difficult for anyone to come in and buy cattle cheaper than that price. And I think from all, uh, with all respect, I think we have to look at the people from the state of Montana as being the leaders in that area. Uh, I believe that, that they have done a terrific job. And I know that we've got a group of people back here that have traveled a long ways uh, to do something and they've got their minds made up that they're going to price their cattle this year. And I think if we all get that same kind of determination that we will be successful in our programs. Our goals this year are to continue to grow, to put together a program that's satisfactory to you. And like Dick Hammond said, how well did we serve you? Uh, I think that the quality of the program is very important. I believe that you will continue to participate and make this program grow. We're going to uh, concentrate in the early part of the year on our programs in Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, Kentucky, and Tennessee, because we have the availability of cattle out of those areas. And I'm looking forward to another year of making progress with you as producers of feeder cattle. And I hope that we will continue to grow. I'm sure that with the positive approach that we've had in this convention, that when we come to our convention in 1979, that we'll be able to see the same kinds of growth and progress that we've seen in the last year. Thank you very much, Ornley. Thank you, Dave. The next report we'll have is a grain report by Ralph Kittleson, the director of the grain department. Thank you, Ornley. I'd like to uh, first publicly announce that or publicly thank Ornley last uh, July to have me come in and ask me again to be the head of the grain department. And I'd like to also thank the board for accepting me because I'm having the time of my life. I can't think of anything and I wouldn't want to trade with anybody of what opportunity and what we can make do as an organization and I am pleased and thankful to be a part of it. I'd like to leave just uh, about one thought with you today in grain. Grain is a, uh, it affects everybody. You either buy it or you sell it or you eat it. And it's the most probably important commodity that we have in this country. It's the beginning of life. And I think probably it's the beginning of a lot of the farm problem. It starts out with, uh, if you can get the grain down cheap enough, it's going to have affect everything else, and it's going to become cheap. And so what I'd like to leave with you when we're talking about the organization and the new National Farm or Farmers Organization, I'd like to leave you with this thought of what the new National Farmers Organization is as far as the grain department. It's a system. That's what's new in the grain department. It was started and nurtured and began in the 15th of January, 1975. And we've been practicing with it. 
and we've got it down to where it works, and it works fine. We have the best system available in the country. And in thinking about it, we have been part of a system that has worked, and it worked exactly the way it was supposed to work. It was the system that was set up by the grain traders, and it's worked perfectly, with the exception of three times in recent history, World War I, World War II, and 73 to 76, and that one you can remember. The way that system has to work is with low prices. And if you'll just think back to 72, 73, when farm prices did go up, from all the factors that got involved at that time, there has been a 20, 25 year period where it's never worked for the producer. During that period, farm prices started to climb and then we have to stop and think of how do we behave as producers at that point. First thing we do is look in our pocketbook and if we've had enough income and we're into the profit part of it, then we wonder about our income tax and we wonder about next year and uh, our cash flow needs have been met so then we get kind of cantankerous and we don't have to sell our grain. And the purpose of the system that has been there was so that the grain trade could get their supply of grain anytime, any place, anywhere they need it. And when the prices rose to the level that when it got to four dollars we wanted six, when it went to six we wanted eight. And it created a complete chaos for the grain trade. So they have to put us back down again to make their system work to keep us short of money so that we have to deliver the grain. So we have to have our own system. There is no way that that system is ever going to benefit farmers. The first rule of business is that if you have a product or a service, you have to learn how to market that product or service. So our system does exactly the same thing this system does. We can deliver the product anytime, anywhere, any place that they need it. Only it's our system. And with our system, we can price it. So I, it seems to me that there isn't any question about which way we have to go. If we want to stay with the old one, we're going to stay with the problem. This one will solve it. So I'm sure a lot of you have been at our grain meetings and listened to the presentations that we had there. We're going to be working with all of you. We've got coordinators that we're going to be working with. And I don't have any doubt that we're not, and we're not kidding anybody, we're going to make this thing work because it's right, it's morally right, and it's our business. And it's time we get at it. Thank you. Next is the Slaughter Cattle Division Report by Walt Hackney, Hackney Director of the Slaughter Cattle Division. Thank you, Orrin Lee. This last year has been probably one of the most challenging and, and I think energetic years I've ever spent in my life. I said it kind of jokingly a year ago in Omaha, Nebraska, that after having been involved two months, I didn't know if I'd be able to last another two because of all the hours and meetings that I'd been involved with, and I found out that they were treating me very gentle at that time. I have had <clears throat> a real gratifying year. You may or may not know it's been a year of a lot of honors for me. The first honor that I had bestowed on me this year was in the state of Iowa. 
<clears throat> I was invited to a meeting in eastern Iowa, and I was made an honorary member of the Eastern Iowa Coon Hunters Association. <clears throat> and then last night, national board member from the state of Kentucky made me an honorary member of the uh, Kentucky Moonshiners Association, and I appreciate that too. <clears throat> I would like to take a little exception with the cotton report you heard. Bob complimented those Spaniards for bringing some cotton in or something. Well, they also brought in a bunch of Coriantes and Longhorns that Dave Miller and I have been having fits with for the rest of this time, and I wish they'd have left them at home. And uh, I'll take some exception also with Dick Hammond on his sheep manure. I don't particularly believe in sheep manure. I think cow manure worked just as well. But I will say this, the, ph the philosophy behind it is certainly true. It's a natural. It's a natural product that makes things grow. And that might be part of what I'd like to discuss with you this morning for a little, little while. You know, there has been, as Dick said, a tremendous amount of emphasis put this year on professionalism, possibly professional marketing in the organization. And I made a comment yesterday in that beef cattle meeting that we had that I believe the emphasis now needs to be put on the talent that we have within ourselves as a membership. I don't know how many of you were able to attend that meeting yesterday, but there was a lady, uh, Mrs. Bobby Cox from Fergus County, Montana, got up there, and she gave as genuine description of this organization's capabilities as I believe has ever been expressed, and I had old-time members come up to me later and make that same comment. If you didn't hear, or if you don't try to get the opportunity at a time in the future to hear, you're really missing something. But she isn't a professional. What she is, is totally committed and dedicated to this cause. She lives and breathes the National Farmers Organization. She wouldn't dream of going out on her own into an outside merchandising program because she does recognize the potential y'all have. You heard a boy get up in that meeting yesterday from Arkansas that 10 months ago told one of our national board members in Omaha, Nebraska, when that board member came in to look over some of his cattle, and that board member said, Ron Shaw, where is my uh, Holstein steers? And Ron said, now, uh, Daryl, uh, are they the black and white ones? Now, we started with that as a base with that young man. But yesterday, you heard a presentation that should have made every man in that room and lady, with the exception of the very youngest that attended, totally ashamed of themselves because of their lack of in-depth study of this organization. He knows more about your organization than I do and a good many other people that attended that meeting, and he understands the total philosophy of the construction of your structure on how the marketing system works, the bargaining of it, the handling of it, and so forth. You had another boy get up yesterday, 25 years old, that today could go into any industry packing company that I'm aware of and could go to work tomorrow morning as a cattle buyer and be one of the upper buyers in that structure. And he's learned it in less than a year. 
He's been complimented to me by the major packers that we do business with on a daily basis. And through a moral ethical code that we have, even though you wouldn't believe that any cattle buyer or packers have any ethics or morals, they have asked me if they could approach him as a buyer, and I've said I'd prefer they didn't, and they haven't at this point. But all I'm trying to illustrate to you is that you need possibly an industry leader to handle the intricate or specifics of bargaining. But from that point, as Dick so aptly put it, the rest is up to you. But the reason it's up to you isn't because of the workload. The reason it's up to you is because you have the talent to do it. You've got it, it's recognizable, but it has been adequately to this point suppressed by industry until you sit on your billfold there keeping your money warm and believe it, that you don't have the talent. Well, you got it. I've recognized it for 20 years, but this is the first time you've ever heard me say it. I wouldn't tell any farmer he had the brains to trade with me because I was afraid he'd believe it. So I'd rather get in his hip pocket while he was standing on his feet and take some of that warm money home with me. And that's what has happened and happened too often. And it's time you recognize precisely what you have. It's time that this organization begins to believe what they have stood out there and in my opinion falsely preached for 20 years. Now Devon Woodland and Orrin Lee Staley will go into shock when they hear me say things like that. But I do feel that I can objectively say that and still maintain the attitude of a leader in this organization. I think in the slaughter cattle program that we've got the exact method of moving, moving cattle that you've got in every other commodity. I hope so because I think the slaughter cattle department this past year has made such strides in bargaining and in marketing and in moving and in adequately descrip describing our moving of these products to the packers and so forth that it's phenomenal. I don't know that you know it or not, but in June, in um, May, in May of this year, your organization had the highest priced fat cattle, fed cattle, that were sold in the Corn Belt, period. In December, your organization sold the highest priced cull cows in the history of the records of the United States Department of Agricultural Marketing Reporting Service. Now how much more do you want? What do you want out of a very confined group of people who possibly or maybe apparently are more dedicated than you are as producers to a cause, and I'm referring to the Home Office in Corning, Iowa. I don't know what more we have to offer unless you believe in what is being done by yourselves and your neighbors, those cattle coordinators, those collection point people, those national board members, and naturally the officers of this organization. I don't know how much more you can possibly expect out of programs. Now I'm not giving you figures that you can't verify. You, you'll find that a 90 cent cow and a 92 cent cow is the highest price paid. You'll find that 66 and a quarter was the highest price steers in the Corn Belt in May.
and they haven't been duplicated. Nothing in our department can everything that has been said or reported can be traced. And I don't consider that to be the problem. You know, to me, if I went to the northern areas of like Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and if I started bragging. Please turn the tape over to side number two.